M is for Mason. G is for Graham. B for Betcha. This is the MGB Wrestling Podcast, the podcast with PG-rated material accessible to wrestling fans of all ages. My name is Graham Bagshaw, and my co-host and creator of this podcast is proof that wrestling fans live with their parents, my 10-year-old son, Mason. So, this is episode A3. Uh, this is our Nova Pro review of the Old Dominion Rumble, which was at the Jewish Community Center on Friday, April the 20th. Okay, do you want to get us started, Mason? You want to tell us about what we noticed when we arrived, first of all? When we noticed when we arrived... The um the front of the building was um under construction, so we had to go through the back, and the gym just looked twice as big too. Well, it looked actually worse than that. They took the letters off on the sign. They had uh, barriers across the door, and it looked, for all intents and purposes, it was closed. We were there pretty early, and there was only a few people hanging around the door where the wrestlers normally go. And it just turned out we were just early, I guess. So. But yeah, they're obviously doing some renovations there. Once we parked the car and walked back, it made it clear what was going on. But yeah, uh, it was certainly a little different. Now, we actually got to join the front line today because it was, um, hey, anybody who's paid in this front row, you get to move to this side and you get to go in first, which was us for the first time. So we were one of the first few people in, so we got to pick wherever we wanted. So we picked um, normally where the camera's behind us, dead center. And actually with the renovations, they've moved the camera. So we were actually, from the camera's perspective, we were on the right-hand side of the ring, but perfectly good seat. All right, what did we do after that then? So we got our seats. We went to the one percenters and we got James Alexander. No, Alexander James. I always get his name mixed Shields, up as well. Faye Jackson and Veda Scott. We did. And we saw that they posted just after the last one that they had some uh, some pictures. And it was ones that we hadn't seen. Um, and some of them were quite old ones. So we asked them, hey, do you still have any ones of these? And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure you've got some. And they posted their merchandise ahead of time. So we picked up the ones that we hadn't got. Um, Alexander James wasn't there, unfortunately, on this one. Uh, but we did manage to see all the other people. And we'll probably talk about those a little bit later as well. So we picked up those pictures unautographed at this point. Okay, what else? We also saw Jake Parnell. We did, yep, the war horse. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get to see him last time. We wanted to see him last time. Uh, he was busy. I uh, didn't get a chance to say hi to him. We actually saw him as he walked in as well. We had, we saw quite a few wrestlers yeah. actually walking in because they came through the same entrance that we came through. Yeah. But we well, we say we didn't say anything at that point because they got suitcases and everything and getting. And ready. we saw his pants. <laughs> yeah, he has those stripy pants. He's always trying to sell those things on Twitter as well. I can't remember what they're called. There's something from the uh, 80s or 90s. I know Mommy has. I actually did buy a pair that's got the Carolina Panthers on because I was going to wear them for Wacky Tacky Day at school. But, yeah, I won't be wearing them any normal time, that's for sure. Yeah, so we saw Jake. Uh, we got a picture. We got an autograph. Uh, we got a photo, all that stuff that we like to do when we're there. And I think that's pretty much it. We saw all other people there. We saw people like Jordan Grace was there, Jonathan Gresham. Uh, we saw the Ugly Ducklings, of course. But I think pretty much we went to our seat because we know that there was going to be some sort of pre-match entertainment or that first one, and that's exactly what happened. What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Benjamin Banks, and you're listening to the MGB Wrestling Podcast. So, in match one, it was Benjamin Banks and Diamond Victor Griff in a tag team match versus Bobby Orlando and Harry Zen, featuring Bobby Jr., which is his go. This was the one we were most excited about, because Benjamin Banks, we just interviewed for, we just released episode nine a couple of days ago. Episode eight was when we interviewed Benjamin Banks, so we were excited about this match. You want to talk about this one, Mason? I saw you in the middle of Matt switch on um, turned on Benjamin and started rooting for Bobby, <laughs> but I stayed with Benjamin the whole time. And yeah, when they walked out, we put the pinkies up, and they said we were doing it wrong. Yeah, they did. They, yeah, Diamond Victor Griff was like, "You're doing the pinkies, but you're doing it wrong." And- I would guess I wasn't paying attention to the picture enough to, to find that out. But yeah, you're right. What I should have said is the last time, actually, Benjamin Banks and Diamond Victor Griff, they actually beat Cisco and Jason Rabatz at Sink or Swim. And that was their debut match. So they're 1-0 and o going into this one. And um, Harry Zen, who's partnering with Bobby Orlando, actually beat Bobby Orlando and CPA at Sink or Swim. So Harry Zen's going in 1-0 and, oh, and Bobby Orlando's going in 0-1. Oh what I liked about the match was, yeah, so Diamond Victor Griff, Last match we saw at Sink or Swim, he was always the loser and everything. Uh-huh. 
And this match, he got him a little offense. He did. He was a lot more dominant this time. He got to tell his story a lot better, and I thought that was good. Yeah, Benjamin was more on the outside. He kept trying to reach to try and grab the other wrestler. But yeah, I thought the story was focused a lot more even this time, which I thought was good. Now, I didn't actually notice this until just a few minutes before we were actually ready to record. Did you notice what Benjamin was wearing? Did you notice the color that he was wearing? Purple? He was. And I don't, I'm not being colorblind. I'm not very perceptive on things like that. And he said on Facebook, actually, two years ago, we lost one of the greatest musicians ever, Prince. Rest in peace, uh, sorry, rest in peace, sir. And thank you for all the awesome music and memories you gave us over the years. So he was actually paying a little tribute there, which oh. went straight over my head. I didn't notice that. He has a very famous album, Purple Rain. Oh. So that was, and it's also a song that you'll sometimes oh, hear on the iPod. Oh, Purple Money, like Rain. I guess so, but he was just a fan of Prince. Yeah. But the album's called Purple Rain. But yeah, as soon as we walked in, this was a big notice because we were ready for cheering for Benjamin because we, we'd been rooting for him. We just interviewed him. We got the pinkies ready and we start clapping. And suddenly you realize, uh-oh, something's not right here. And he's like this, shut up. Stop clapping. I was like, oh my god, he's gone back to the heel again. He just talked about we saw him as a face, and then the next month later he's turned into a heel. So, and and a very good heel as well. I, I was booing for him. I was like, boo! I didn't care. I didn't care. He was trying to. He was. He always say he wasn't being nice. He was cheating. He was doing all the dirty little moves. And um, I don't actually have much for this match. I didn't even have the finish for this match. All I do know is um, Bobby did win. Oh, sorry, Benjamin did win, and uh, Diamond Victor Griff got the win, and Bobby Orlando and Harry Zan lost. And at the end of the match, they actually took Bobby Orlando's goat, and Diamond Victor Griff did what looked like a people's elbow to me. Yeah, and what I also like that Benjamin did, he did the five, uh, money shuffle. He did, he did, and he talked about that, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember talking about that. That was kind of cool, I like that as well. Um, this was one of the shorter matches, this was 7 minutes and 14 seconds. And then the part at the end that was really cool, after the match had all finished, Bobby Orlando rolls out the ring, looks straight at us and said, I don't remember his exact quote, it was either I love your podcast or I like your podcast. He was like, whoa, that's really cool. He just got beat, but he still took time to say something really nice And then they got us. a high five. He got a high five as well. And mm -hmm. I was hoping, I was like, I don't want to look behind us. I don't want to see if there's any other podcasters there. But we checked later. He was definitely talking about us. So that was kind of cool that he said that. That's some kayfabe there. Yeah, and he actually said later, he said, keep it up, guys. Keep up the good work. So that was kind of cool that he did that. On Twitter, um, we know Benjamin lives in the, ha I keep wanting to say Hampton, the Norfolk area of Virginia. So we knew he had a quite a long drive. He put on Twitter, I've been up since 6 a.m. yesterday morning, and I'm just getting home now. This is like 4 a.m., I think, on Sunday morning. Oh. I'm really tired, but it was all worth it, beating up at the Bobby Orlando's GOAT at VA Wrestling. I hope that thing never walks again. So anyway, Bobby Banks... Uh, why do I keep saying Bobby? Benjamin Banks is now 2-0 at Nova Pro. Harry Zen is 1-1, and Bobby Orlando is 0-2. Match 2 is Lady Luck versus Angelus Lane. It was. And in the last encounter, this was the Ripper to Shreds. Um, Angelus Lane actually defeated Rain in the main event. And actually, Lady Luck won as well. She beat, I think it's Machiko. I think that's how you pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, Machiko. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about this match a little bit? Lady Luck, she always comes out with that unicorn, and I like that. It's <laughs> like, um, yeah, she's like the um, Bailey. She's kind of like that character. Ex I agree. Except, I know exactly what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. And, except she's not like the huggy character. She's no. like the all happy and cheerful mm -hmm. one. And Angelus Lane, she's this mean <laughs> old person that likes to beat up people. She's and not going to be very nice to you if you call her old. I'm pretty sure she's under 30. <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> and I like the the um thing she said when she kept choking Angela. Um, she kept choking Lady, Lady. Luck. And and the ref said, "Come on, come on, you gotta listen." And then she said, "I'm I'm listening to you. I'm just ignoring you." Absolutely, and I wrote that in one of my messages. I thought that was really cool. I really liked that one. Now I thought the thing for this one, it was kind of interesting. The support from the crowd it was actually for both. The guy next to us was definitely pro Laney. He kept saying Laney and let's go Laney. But you also had people also saying let's go Angelus as well. So you could hear there was a support for both of them. And um, the thing I remembered about Lainey as she walked in, she actually saved the stream. <laughs> Somebody threw a stream at her, and she's like, oh, I'm going to save this. And she sort of oh, yeah. folded up a little bit. That was the person and next she, to uh, Yeah, and she put it under her little unicorn hat. Yeah, uh, it's like um, Space Monkey. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, now for the match, I don't have much for this one as well. 
And I got the end part for this. So there was a swinging neck break from the top rope, but it was just a counter two for Laney. And it looked like that could have been a finishing move easily. Um, but Angela Lane recovered from it really quickly. And um, she delivered what's called the Grave Digger. Now, I didn't have that. I found that one on pwponderings.com. And it was a one, two, three in just under eight minutes, seven minutes and 57 seconds. Now, actually, Laney Luck tweeted after the match, which I thought was really nice. I always appreciate being pushed to new limits. Thank you, at Angela Lane. I hope we meet again. So setting up a possibility of a future encounter. But I thought that was really nice of Laney to go to the trouble of saying that. Yeah. Match three is Jonathan Gresham with Stokely Hathaway versus Sage Phillips. It was. And let's look at the form from the last one. So in February, Commonwealth Cup 2008 qualifying match at Cupid's Chokehold, Sage Phillips actually defeated Bo Crockett, Bobby Shields, Bro Keller, Dominic Guarini, and Graham Bell within seven minutes and four seconds. So he was on a winning streak. And the last time we saw Jonathan Gresham was actually in December 2017. It was the Powerbomb TV independent title match, and it was against Sam J. Dot when he actually got injured. So they're both coming off wins for this one. All right, what did you make of this match? Well, I like um, Jonathan Gresham and Sage Phillips. Me too. Because they're like these savage people, and like they're like really good at wrestling. And Sage Phillips came out with a um, black eye. Yeah, there was something there about that, and you pointed it out, and I couldn't see exactly, but yeah, I don't know if he'd took an in, taken an injury in the last few days or something. Um, also, at the start, his character was kind of interesting as well. Sage was wait At the start, Sage Phillips was actually waving at Stokely Hathaway, which obviously he wasn't interested in at all. And he actually extended his hand to shake Jonathan Gresham's hand as well, and Stokely was frowning at that as well. And they did, they shook hands. And actually, the chant from the crowd was, sportsmanship, and he wasn't impressed with that either. So yeah, at the start, there was a few little things going on. What about the match? Well, the match, I really liked the match. And there was lots of submissions on um, Sage Phillips' left shoulder. and mm -hmm. he, he was definitely working that throughout the match. You could see that. Yeah, Yeah, he did multiple octopus stretches. Mm -hmm. I remember Jonathan Gresham jumped off the top rope and hit um, Sage's shoulder. Mm -hmm. And he's really attacking that shoulder when I thought the get-go he should be like punching his eye or something. Yeah, yeah. And then he was certainly targeting that one thing, but yeah, he didn't focus on that one. Now, the thing I liked about it, it was really even as well. They often put heads together right in the middle of the ring, and there was like tests of strength, and they would even each other out. Uh, there was lots of chops against each other, taking it in turns, which was even. They were also bouncing off the ring and knocking into each other, which knocked the other one back, and then they would do the same. So it was very evenly matched, Matt. Uh, very sorry, a very evenly matched match. Um, one of the things I did like in the middle of it as well, Gresham faked he was going to do a slap. He got himself ready for a chop. Didn't do it, and you can see Sage was bracing for itself, and then he just punched him in the stomach, which I thought was kind of funny. It makes me think, why wouldn't you do that more in real matches? That was kind of a cool little trick. I, I guess it would be boring if you did that all the time, but I, that was one other thing I liked. Um, anything else for this match before we get to the finish? Yeah, before he did the chop, I thought it would be like, oh, it's a replay of AJ and Shinsuke, but uh -huh. no. He actually took it to a different level. Yeah, he did. He added that thing in. He didn't just stop. He actually did something with it. So uh, to finish off the match then, um, there was a suicide dive by Sage Phillips, which actually came right next to us, because Jonathan Gresham was on the outside, and you thought at that point Sage had started to take the lead, and actually it didn't happen. He got him into the ring and did get a near three count, but actually Jonathan Gresham just flipped himself up. He just stood up, in the, he was lying down on the floor, did that little flip, oh, stood like up. Sean? Like Sean, did a Pele kick, there was a suplex, and he pinned Sage he pinned Sage Phillips uh, with a reverse prawn hold, which I also stole from that website because I didn't know that move, um, in 11.32. I've seen the one where they sort of flip over backwards. Um, I've seen Charlotte do that one a lot as well, but I didn't know that it was called a reverse prawn hold, so I learned something from this match as well. After the match, there was also a promo. Um, Stokely Hathaway came into the ring, took the microphone, and they talking about the, a rematch for the Powerbomb TV title that Jonathan Gresham lost. Partly because he was injured and he was actually forced to have, um, I believe it was a triple threat match. So they've said at the next pay-per-view event, which is Thread of Joy on May 10th, he's going to be fighting hot sauce Tracy Williams. And you think it's that, but what what happened after that? Yeah, I think we saw hot sauce at, um, I can't even... AIW? Yeah, AIW. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because I remember this the little girl that was around um, five, she was yelling hot sauce, mm -hmm. hot sauce. Logan came out. He did. And he's being all friendly, and now mm -hmm. it's a triple threat match. It is, and he was complaining. I know he lost his title belt as well, yeah. but I don't remember what happened. But he robbed on um, Sage Phillips. He, he did, and I'm not saying he necessarily did. But anyway, he's managed to get a triple threat match out of it, and actually it was confirmed later on Nova Pro 
website that yeah may May 10th is going to be uh, it's going to be Jonathan Gresham versus Hot Sauce Tracy Williams versus Logan Easton Leroux in a triple threat match. Now, also at the end of this one as well, um, I saw Sage Phillips had tweeted something out. He's at Sage Phillips Seven. Um, a grueling night at VA Wrestling. Finally went one on one against at the Jonathan at the John Gresham. I didn't get the victory, but I proved I can go toe to toe with the best technical wrestler in the world. Thank you, Gresham, for testing me. Let's wrestle again. Hashtag Back to Basics. And I agree, Jonathan Gresham, somebody who we know is in the Ring of Honor as well. Um, he is, he's a very good wrestler. And I thought Sage Phillips matched up with him really well. And perhaps in the future, that's something where he can start to get the edge. But I thought, I was very impressed with Sage Phillips. Not just in this match, but also one we'll talk about later as well. Yeah, Nova has some big stars and stars in training too. Absolutely, yeah. And when you look at them, I've also got some names to talk to you about later as well. You will see some of those people who was like, oh wow, they're in Nova Pro. So yeah, definitely some stars for the future here. In match four is Palmiel, Ali Cat, and Christy James versus the Hooligans. It is, and we we're going to look what the Hooligans' name is. We know one's Mason. Mason, <laughs> got the same yeah. name. Uh, oh, Tottenham. and uh, Brian Cutter or something like that. Uh, it's something Cutter. Cutter. I remember the. I don't remember his first name. So in the last time we saw these people, um, Ali Cat actually defeated Holiday at Ripper to Shreds, and last time we saw Palmiel as a team, they actually defeated the Colonies, who were Kerry Awful and uh, Nick Iggy. Now we actually talked about this on the outside, and I thought it was pretty clear Palmiel's going to win. Yeah. I don't think there was any doubt about this. Um, but it didn't actually turn out that way. No. Now, uh, let me talk about the other match. Uh, the Hooligans, last time they featured, it was actually against uh, the Ugly Ducklings, and they actually lost in 6 minutes and 52 seconds. And that was the match when I believe Lance Lude wasn't feeling very well either. Yeah, yeah. He okay. was under the feathers. Under the feathers, as Rob said. Correct. And again, Pow Meow, Alley Cat's in the ring, and that Cutter and Mason, he puts his hand out and Mason flips. On to Alley Cat, he steps off his hand and then he does a flip onto Alley Cat, and that looks like it was like kind of acrobatic. Hurts. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was kind of acrob acrobatic. Now I got some stuff before that, so let me jump in at this point. So the Hooligans started off by saying that this match was going to be easy, but they wanted to go through some rules. They said that they weren't going to punch women. Okay, so like all right, fair enough. They're going to start off nicely. And before they did it, they had their silly little thing, which I think Pow Meow always is going to have that. And you know that I'm a big fan of those gimmicky things. So they said they were going to have a scratch off. So they were talked about they were going to scratch each other's back and they were going to take it in turns to do it to see if it could last the longest. And I think it was Mason Cutter said he'd already been sharpening his nails up. You couldn't really tell, but it was, that's the way they were going with it. And Christy Jane, Jane shouted out to him, you've already had your tenor shot, Ali, so you should be okay with this one. Um, and they did that, and they did it for a few times, and it did look kind of painful as well. Ali did not look very comfortable at all in that position. Yeah, she was um, biting her shirt. She was biting her shirt, and I took a picture for that, and that was actually my favorite picture of the whole night, because you can actually see, you can't see Mason cut behind her, but you can see his arms are raised up into the air, ready to scratch her. So that was something that started off with that one. Also, I've got on here, the match, hard, I thought for me the match really kicked off after there was a Hurricane DDT by Christy James from the top rope. I thought that at that point it looked like to me the Hurricanes, well, not the Hurricanes, the Hooligans were starting to get the, the edge in that match. After that one, they were both tired because Christy James had been out of it for a while. They went in and they got a double tag. But then after that, it just started to get silly. The, the Hooligans, they had way longer than five seconds because everyone shouting to them, five seconds, right? They double teamed Ali for a good 30 seconds on that match. And at that point, I think it was pretty obvious that they probably were going to win that match. I was really confident that the Pow Meow was going to win the match, and the Hooligans won. They did, and there's probably one more big thing in this match that happened in between that. After there was all that double teaming going on, all four of them ended up being down in the ring after exchanging blows and stuff. They all left the ring, got a steel chair, and we actually got some more space at this point. They actually picked up a chair that was next to us where somebody was actually sat, but then they didn't leave anything on the chair, took that into the ring, and anyway, all four of them took the chair in. And even though he wasn't even at this event, Tim Donst wasn't here, which is surprising for us at Nova Pro because he normally is. We still got the current chant. And I can't remember. I think he said that's not safe when they took the chairs in. Or they said safety first. They probably remembered it because of Alley Cat, um, sure. Safety Cat. Sure. Yeah. And then in the last match. But I thought it was funny that he gets a mention even when he's not there. And anyway, actually, they didn't use the steel chairs. They threatened to do it. But actually, they just put them down in the ring. And they set them up in like a circle. And they just exchanged blows around the outside. I'm going to be honest, I didn't really buy into that one too much. I didn't like that segment. And actually, I know people on Twitter complained about that last time in the Holiday match. They put Holiday on a chair, and then she gave her slaps on the chair. And I don't think anyone really liked that. And for the same reason with this one, I wasn't really getting into this one. Uh, eventually, there was just two people left, and I just have after that Hooligans one. I, I kind of lost interest in this match this yeah. time. Well, the only thing about the chairs is, 
somebody gets chopped, and then mm-hmm. you chop somebody else, and then that gives you time to recover, mm-hmm. and then it's like that. It was too slow for me. I and didn't then see the point. Christy James ended it instead of chopping uh, Mason. He, she kicked him over, and mm-hmm. then the chair toppled over. And then there was just the two of them left. Now at the end, and this also didn't make a lot of sense to me. The hooligans admitted they only won because of a sucker punch. And they said that. no punch. They just said well, no a sucker calls, punch. Right? Just, yeah, I, I don't know why they would admit to that anyway. If you're the villains or the heels, you're not going to admit to that. And then they started shaking hands, and I was like, yeah, I don't get this at all. Either you're playing the heel or you're not playing the heel. I didn't quite know where that ending went. And I, I think this match actually disappointed me a little bit. I, I had much higher expectations for this one. Um, do you have anything else for this one? No. Match five is a triple threat match. Veda Scott versus Facebook versus Jordan Blade. Okay, so in the last time that we saw uh, Veda Scott, it was actually a street fight against Faye Jackson at uh, Such Great Heights, which is the one over Christmas at the Annandale Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, Facebook was new. We heard she was from, I think it was Sydney, Australia. Um, she's actually only 21 years old, which I, you couldn't tell. She was actually a, a luchadora. She actually had a mask on, and so you couldn't actually tell from that. And uh, she says on her Twitter page she likes to lift weights and eat pancakes. And uh, Jordan Blade, uh, sorry, Jordan Blade, we've seen before as well. Uh, she defeated Jocelyn at Sink or Swim, and she actually defeated Harlow O'Hara at Ripper to Shred. So she actually came into this one two and zero. Now, as she was walking in, we actually had one of those signs, the Vader Scott sign. So I actually waved the Vader Scott sign, and she came over and she said, "Like, oh, how much did you pay for that? Ten? I was thinking, well, I did pay nearly ten dollars for it." But then she said thousand, so I didn't really want to say that, but I was like, yeah, sure, something like that. And uh, left it at that. Um, do you want to talk about this match? Yeah, well, Veda Scott and Jordan Blade at the start, they were like, hey, we should be a team. We have the same color pants and stuff like that. And then um, Jordan Blade, they're like, no, I want to work with Facebook. <laughs> and then they just kick her out the ring and uh, and Vader said at one point when they were trying to tee up, I definitely won't turn on you. And everyone in the audience was like, yeah, right, that's not happening. Yeah, well, we also got a high five from uh, Jordan Blade, too, at the start. We did, yeah. It's one of the advantages of being front row, which we're not normally. So we missed a few early because we didn't even think about it. We were, like, we were trying to write down who was in the match, and then it was like, oh, they already came by us. So we missed a few. Now, one thing I noticed from the front row, though, as well, you do see more errors. Now, when you're further back, you might not notice all this stuff. And it makes me think, when we're watching WWE, way, way back, how much stuff do we actually miss? Um, one of them was pretty obvious, because we both looked at each other. Uh, Vader Scott actually kicked the turnbuckle and not Jordan Blake at one point. But Jordan Blake acted like she'd been kicked. I don't have much for this match at all. This was actually the shortest match of all. Six minutes and seven seconds. Uh, Vader Scott got the pin, and that was it. And for some of these matches, actually, it was we were kind of into them so much that we didn't always necessarily write stuff down. I think we were, we were kind of, it, I thought overall the matches were good. I think this, for me, I think this is actually the best um, Nova Pro event that we've been to so far. Yeah, so if you're thinking, like, we don't have much notes, it's because it's a pretty good match and we're into it. And that was certainly true. And that first one with Benjamin Banks, we didn't write anything down until the second match. We were like, oh, did you write anything? It was like, oh, no, I didn't either. So, yeah, we, we were actually really into this. I was trying to really watch it this time. I know before I took that, this time, I'm just going to write key words down and then try and piece it together later. Now, after the match, it was announced Rachel Ellering will be in the Commonwealth Cup, which I thought was really exciting. Um, I actually looked at the results that were posted later. It didn't actually mention Rachel Ellering is going to be in the Commonwealth Cup, so I don't know if they, that was just an omission on the report, but it certainly that sounded like what it was supposed to be. Now, actually, Skyler was supposed to be in one of these matches today, and uh, she actually beat Rachel Ellering in a great match at the WWR, which our friends from the Blade, Shop t- uh, Blade Job Show told us about. So there was also a few other omissions from this match as well. Um, Isla Dawn was supposed to be at this one, but she had a family emergency, so she was in Scotland. And uh, Daphne Unger, the Scream Queen, um, had a health issue, so she needed to take care of that as well. And I wonder if we might get to see Paul Ellering manage Rachel Ellering. Nope, I'm, I'm going to say know, right now. I'm calling that as an absolute... That would be cool, thought. that would be cool. But it certainly sounds like that they are father and uh, daughter, which I, I said on a previous podcast, I wonder. I think I found the answer. Yes, it definitely is. Because they actually talked about her being a second-generation wrestler. Yeah. And there was somebody else who they mentioned was a third-generation wrestler, and I wish I could remember who that was off the top it, of my head. It is a slight possibility, though. Mm-hmm. Match 6 is uh, Ugly Ducklings and Eric Royal versus the One Percenters, Logan Easton LaRoe, Bobby Shields, and Gunnar Miller. And we already talked to the last time that the Ugly Ducklings beat the Hooligans. 
Um, Eric Royal actually lost to Gunnar Miller at the same event as well. That was a really good match. And uh, Logan and Bobby Shields lost to Ali and Tim Dunst, which was not listed on the cage match where I normally find my results. But it was technically not really a match. It was right at the start of we were cut to shreds. So I guess they did talk about that. Do um, you want to talk about this match? Well, I, I like there was lots of launch McQuacks on. Yeah. We love our signature moves from the Ugly Ducklings. And um, at the start, I keep getting Lance and Rob mixed up. Okay. Well... Um, Rob, Lance no, was Lance. in for a long yeah, time, and he took a bit of a beating at the start yeah. of that match. Yeah, he was like, uh, er Eric Roy was in, and then uh, the one percenters started shouting, "We want that guy!" And then yeah. they were pointing at Lance, uh -huh. and then, and then they were like, "This dude!" And then they tagged him in, and uh -huh. he was in there for a long time. He was. He took a lot of punishment. He does take a lot of punishment. I can say he's a lot. He's a much smaller guy than some of the other wrestlers there, but he takes a lot of punishment, and he always seems to manage to get a tag in. Now, I wasn't worried about this one, because I was like, there's no way you're going to have Eric Royal and Rob Kiljoy on the side, and then just not tag them in. So you knew at some point they were going to get involved. Now, the match actually started off with Rob Kiljoy and Logan. It was pretty even. Um, and then, actually, Rob tagged in Eric Royal, and Logan immediately left the scene. He was like, I don't want anything to do this. And I don't remember which person he tagged on his team, but he didn't want anything to do with that. And Logan actually lost to Eric at Nova Project 3 in September. But actually, the reverse happened in the Commonwealth Cup last year when Logan actually beat Eric Royal. And that storyline is going to be important for later as well. Now, the thing I got from this match is there was two great suicide dives. So Logan and Bobby Shields were on the outside. First of all, Rob, you could see they were setting it up. Rob did his suicide dive. Unfortunately, it was on the opposite side of the ring to where we were, so we didn't get to see it as well. And yeah. then Lance came in, and he did exactly the same thing. Yeah, so there was something you missed, though. When Lance jumped out, when um, Rob jumped out, Lance tagged him, mm -hmm. and then he came in the ring, and then he jumped out. Which is Eric why Royal he was legal. Correct, which is why they and were legal Gutter to Miller do that. And then and Eric Royal had a face off. Mm -hmm. There were some, and then in the end, it came down to Eric and Gunnar. Um, there was a blind tag at the end, and Gunnar Miller came back in again. He power slammed Rob Killjoy, and it, the match ended after 12 minutes and 47. I thought it was a good match. It had all the the, the ugly Ducklings moves we wanted to see in there. It had the competition between those guys. It set up again Logan and uh, Eric Royal. Um, I thought it was a perfectly good match. I like that match. Yeah, and the thing I also noticed was that on Lance's back, he had a tattoos of wings on him. Oh, we did? Ducks. Oh, wow. I didn't notice that. Yeah. Huh. So after that, actually, this was the last match before the intermission. I'm pretty sure, isn't every match we've been to, the Ugly Ducklings is always right before the intermission? Because yes, yes. then they go straight from the ring to their merch table, and always they're surrounded. They're just such a popular tag team. Um, I would say we love them, obviously, but so do everybody else. Anyone who's not seen them always seems to get drawn into them. Yeah, even when we saw them just debuting... In Hagerstown, mm -hmm. we already knew them, but mm -hmm. other fans didn't, and they caught on in like five minutes. Oh, they did. As soon as they walked in, they were like, quack, quack, and the, they do. the fans were quacking along too. It, and... it, it's great. It's great. I actually saw somebody post in a tweet re um, probably about a couple of months ago, that, and they tagged people from NXT, like, you need to get these guys in. They just interact with the crowd so well. And, and they do. They're crowd favorites, for sure. So, what did we do at the intermission, then? So in the intermission, we got Bobby Orlando's autograph. Mm -hmm. We got Faye Jackson's autograph. Now, for Bobby Orlando, he didn't actually have any photographs, unfortunately. So yeah. we got a sticker from him. Oh, that's kind of nice. I actually just put it up on your door. So yeah, we got I saw something that. that. Something a little different for that one. Yeah, and we got autographs from Vader yeah. Scott and Faye Jackson from the pictures we bought earlier. And Faye was just about to leave. And we asked her, like, Faye, is it okay? Can you sign this? And she did, and she wrote a message for you as well. And we like, can we get a quick picture? And I'm fumbling with my camera trying to take it. And then she left. I had totally forgotten she hadn't even had her match. And she was actually the first match, I believe, after yeah, the intermission. Yes. So she was really polite. And if I'd have realized, I would have just waited until the end. But no, everybody there is just so nice. Um, but no, she was really good with that. Um, we already found that... Um, we didn't see Bobby Shields, but we were told he was going to be there after the match, and so we got him later. And we looked around for Benjamin Banks. We really wanted a photograph, couldn't find him. And actually, we got a message on Twitter. It's like, hey, can we see you at the end? We want a picture. And we definitely wanted to see him. We definitely wanted that picture as well, having interviewed him recently as well. Match 7 was Faye Jackson versus Harlow O'Hara. It was. And, and from the previous results on this, uh, last time we saw Faye Jackson, she was in the Commonwealth Cup qualifying uh, versus Tara Calloway, where she won. Uh, the last time that we saw Harlow O'Hara, actually twice we saw her, uh, she lost to Jordan Blade in the uh, Ripper to Shreds, 
And she also lost in the Singapore swim to Aspen Rose and Hyan and Jinx. So she actually went in 0-2. And, and Harlo Ohara, she's just a great heel. And what she came in first and then she looked totally bored. She was sitting on the top <laughs> rope watching Faye just look so bored. And she makes a great heel. And I said to you as well, I said, I love her facial expressions. She tells a great story. Like when she only gets a count of two and she thinks it's three, she gets really upset by it. Um, she has just a total disdain for the ref as well and gets annoyed with the ref. She was somebody who didn't really catch my eye that much on the original tryout show, but I followed all the I always follow the people on Twitter so I can follow their story. Over that last month, I've actually really got into it. I've seen some of her videos and different things. She's got a great character. Um, I'm really glad she came back. And at 0-2, I'm like, oh man, you've got to face Faye Jackson. You're probably going to go 0-3. I was like, she does not deserve that. She's a really good wrestler, and I'm definitely hoping to see more of her. Um, do you want to talk about this match at all? How it developed? Yeah. How it great. ended? Yeah, well, Faye Jackson's always dancing around. and um, Yeah, she's always dancing around, interacting with the crowd, and trying to get the, the crowd to dance in, too. Mm-hmm. She's pretty fan interactive, too. There's a great picture, actually. Somebody posted. I, I, I'm really bad. I can't remember the name of the group that posts this, but they post a lot of pictures from Nova Pro. And it shows you Faye running around the outside with her hand extended, and you can see people. she's got a big smile on her face. And you see the fans always like those high fives. So, yeah, she's really good with that. Now, at the end of the match, um, she was actually dominating this one, and Harlow was actually in a little bit of trouble. And she was about to do a cannonball into her, and she quickly tried to drag the ref. And actually, the ref took the full brunt of the cannonball. So the ref is totally out of it, and at this point, Angelus Lane came back into it. So Angelus Lane attacked Faye, puts Harlow on top of Faye. I'm trying to remember this, but I think that's what happened. And then she dragged the ref into position, and then, of course, the ref wakes up, and he counts one, two, three. And this was also the joint shortest match. This was also six minutes and seven seconds. So I was surprised by that. It felt like it was much more into that match. Um, I'm surprised it ended so much. They got a lot of stuff in that in such a short match. And I thought Faye deserved to win. But I also, like I said, I didn't think Harlow deserved to go zero and three as well. So I thought that was kind of good as well. Now, I also saw a few people post on Twitter afterwards as well. If you see Casey posted, Angelus and Harlow as a team. And I hadn't even thought about that. That would be a great heel tag team. Angelus Lane and Harlow O'Hara. I think that would be really good. Yeah, versus Alley Cat and Faye Jackson. And at Scott Nick Moore also posted, I'm all for Angelus Lane and Harlow Harlow working together, the Priestess and the Bride of Frankenstein. That works, right? And I agree. I had not even thought about that for a second. We don't see there's many women tag teams, but I think that would be a, certainly a good one. In match eight is John Schuyler versus Warhorse versus Yuta Wheeler versus Percy Davis. Now, John Schuyler, I thought I'd recognized the name, and I couldn't remember why. Here's why I actually recognized the name. I looked on Twitter. He's actually been on NXT, he's been on WWE, and he's been in Ring of Honor. Now, I believe this is his debut, as far as I can tell. That's not the reason why I remembered him, though. I don't think either of us picked up on this, because I looked on his record to see who he's actually been fighting. We saw him last week. He was at Maryland Championship Wrestling. He fought against Greg Excellent. <laughs> Oh, that's why as I soon as I saw him. it, it was like, oh, that's so far kind of silly not recognizing that before. We also saw his match on WWE only a couple of weeks ago. He lost to No Way Jose in 25 seconds. Remember the guy who dances around the ring? And yeah. From NXT? So he's actually been on a few matches recently. Oh, and I, I said there's another big name. He lost to Cassius Ono on NXT in February as well. So he's a legit wrestler right here. He's been in some big Is matches. Is he still wrestling WWE now? That I don't know about. That's That remains to be seen, but it was probably pulled, well, certainly for the No Way Jose, he was obviously pulled in as like the job, but he's going to lose quickly, but that was it. But cool that you can actually even do that stuff. Um, I was really impressed with John Schuyler. His win rate for 2018 is only 18%, which is absolutely appalling. And um, Warhorse made his Nova Pro debut at Cupid's Chokehold and a loss to Tim Dunst, which he was never going to win that one, unfortunately, for him. So he came in 0-1. Uh, Wheeler Yuda was making his third appearances. He lost to John Kerman on his debut in November, and he lost to Logan Easton Leroux in February. So he's coming in 0-2. And uh, Percy Davis, this was actually his third Nova Pro match. We haven't seen any of his previous two, though. Um, he came in in February 2017 and May 2017, and one of those matches he lost was a four-way uh, match involving Isaiah Fraser and Sage Phillips. So that would be kind of tough to win against regulars like that as well. And I don't really have much for this match because I was really into it, and I was also rolling up a banner. <laughs> streamer. Which, yeah, streamer, which we'll talk about in the next match. Uh-huh. Okay, well, I'll go ahead then, because I definitely have stuff for this match. It started off with uh, Percy Davis handing out candy. He comes, well, he actually handed it out to the crowd, first of all. 
Uh, we managed to get one piece, I think it was. And then he threw like a whole bag to one person as well. Okay, so he handed out a lollipop to uh, Yuda. He takes it, and then they both start playing with their lollipops and sucking on the lollipops. And then he tries to hand one to uh, Sky to John Skyler, and he refuses it. Uh, and so did Warhorse. He didn't want a piece of candy either. And in fact, actually, they knocked the candy out of their hands. So it was like, ooh. Um, and then anyway, they got the guys with the lollipops actually got the advantage. They took their guys, took them to the ring posts, climbed up, and then started hitting them in the head while the crowd's counting. One, two, three. And then normally they stop at ten. Once they got to nine, they took their lollipops out of their mouths and they stuck it in their opponent's mouths. Which you, know, you can hear from the crowd, that is gross. And I thought it was funny. I really liked that part. Now, part of the storyline for this story was uh, John Skyler and Warhorse claimed that they had a deal throughout. And they were trying to work together. And it did. They did work together until one of them was about to win. So it would be like, one, two, and then you'd pull them off the top. And it's like, what are you doing? I thought we had a deal. And they're like, all right, all right, let's go for it. And then the, well, the roles would reverse. Oh, yeah, the they other would one do like... We had a, a deal. deal. And then they would shake hands. And then they would just do the reverse. So whoever was the person that wasn't involved, they would do the pin. One, two, the same thing, the guy would pull them up on three. So I thought that was kind of, I kind of like that storyline as well. Um, that also carried on. Warhorse delivered a stomp on the back after jumping from the top rope on John Skyler, which I thought was really good. And he actually said, do you all this? Anyway, the end of the match, I don't even have a finish. Um, I know you'd have qualified, and I think he deservedly so. He shouldn't go 0-3. and three. He's been someone who's impressed us for both of our matches, and I actually called Yuda to win this one before it even started. You could just tell it was going that way. Now, I knew Warhorse wasn't going to win, and that's who we were rooting for, because I actually looked on his schedule, and he has a list of where he's fighting and when he's not fighting open matches, and he had an open date for when the Commonwealth Cup is. So if he was going to win that match, obviously he wouldn't be taking bookings for when the Commonwealth Cup so it's kind of unfortunate that I knew part of that match before it even started. After the match, Fred Yehai was also announced as being in the tournament, and that was according to PWPonderings.com. So in match 9, it's Shazza McKenzie versus Jordan Grace. It was. Um, last time we saw Jordan, we talked about this a second ago, she defeated Isla Dawn and Laney Luck in the Commonwealth Cup qualifying. And Shazza McKenzie, this was her debut. She's from Australia. She's also the former Shimmer champion, as far as I can tell. I think that's the name of that title. Um, Mason, I want you to tell us about the start of this match, I and mean, you already alluded to it a second ago, about um, your little streamer that you were winding up. I'm good. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell the story then. Um, I wish I had video for this. I can't wait for Powerbomb to show this one. So everyone's throwing the streamers in, they all unravel and all this thing. Mason just threw it, and it just went like a ball. But it didn't unravel at all, and it just hit. Did it hit her on the leg? Yeah. It hit Shazza on the leg, and I just thought it was so funny. And um, Shazza just picked it up, and she just basically gave it back to you and said, look, here, have another try, which I thought was I thought it was really funny. I know you don't think it's funny, but I know other people thought it was funny too. And the guy next to you said, look, you got to unravel it a little bit. So anyway, you got a second chance, and you got to throw it at Jordan Grace, right? Yeah. There you go. So you got two for the price of one. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Um, the match itself, Jordan starts off by showing her muscles, because I, I can never remember the figure, but it mentions how much she can bench press. She's really strong. And Shazza flexes, but she just doesn't have that level. And she's like, I got these too. She did, but nowhere near to that level. The thing I liked about this one, you could tell Shazza was really good. Yeah. Um, she she actually dominated Jordan for certain parts of this match, which I haven't seen any other wrestler do in Nova Pro so far. She actually had her in submission holds three or four yeah. times, yeah. and Jordan managed to get out of them. They were sleepers. But yeah, she was trying to get that. And you could see Jordan was uncomfortable, um, just the way she was on. So Shazza was a great technical wrestler. And the crowd, interestingly for this one, there was a chance of, come on, let's go Jordan and let's go Shazza. There was also big periods of the time when the crowd was dead. You couldn't hear anything. You could hear them talking. And why? I think they were just so into the match. I thought it was a really good match. Yeah. And they were just so enthralled with that. And I thought that was really cool, that. Um, I don't have much for the end of this one. I know Jordan won in the end. I don't even remember down how she won. I don't really care. I just thought it was a great match. And actually, thinking back, this might actually be my favorite. Obviously, the, the, the Minion Rumble itself was the, probably the best match. But that's kind of a different one. In terms of the pre-matches leading up to that one, I think this was my favorite match. Yeah, actually. it definitely was mine, too. Um, 11 minutes and 29 seconds. And it could have gone for 30 minutes, and I would have been quite happy with it. I like the dynamic between the two. Uh, it's a shame she's from Australia. I think this is her 10th trip over here. I think I just heard on her on a review so she doesn't come over all the time but hopefully she will more in the future and the only time we heard it please come back yeah you heard it from the crowd and it was certainly too true now i actually just listened to an interview with uh Shazza mckenzie and it was hinted that actually she's just gone for a tryout at nxt last week mm -hmm. so there is a possibility that we might see more of Shazza in the future but probably not a nova pro possibly even on television so i think that would be pretty cool as well 
So, the last event, the main event, was the Old Dominion Rumble. That was why we were there. Last week, we saw a steel cage match. We'd never seen a Rumble before. They limited the time a little bit. They limited it to 75 seconds. They did have all 30 people, though, which I thought was really good. And um, I think you got the order that they came in. So, do you want to talk about the first two people? Yeah, the first two people were Bo Crockett and Sage Phillips. <laughs> and Sage Phillips, we've already talked about, already had a match. He'd had mm -hmm. a, match, a tough match against Jonathan Gresham. So, coming in number two, that's a tough break for him. With a black eye. <laughs> With a black eye. And the thing that we noticed straight away, you couldn't really see the clock. No. The no. clock was way too low. Uh, we were on the far side of the ring. You're too low to be able to see it because you've got the ring in front of you. I'm tall enough to see it, but even I couldn't see it. I could see tiny little bits. I'm like, how are we going to know when it's counting down? Now, luckily, they did have the ring announcers there who were counting down when you got to 10. And that first one was really cool because it was just like being there, right? We did it. 10, yeah. 9, and they got to 1. And I'd heard this on one of the other pay-per-views, that WWR one I talked about recently. And I was interested to hear if people would do the same thing. After 1, would they go, ah? Like the klaxon actually does. And did they? Uh, you bet they did. Every single time. It was like, three, two, one. Ah. So that was kind of good. Sometimes you couldn't always hear that later in the match. Because you were so engrossed in the match. I think they were as well. They kind of forgot a little bit. That would be one thing that I didn't like about this. I want the clock higher, like you said. Like almost like a shot clock. Yeah, a basketball. and there was a basketball shot clock. Too. There was. I don't know if they can change that. I know shot clock's normally like at 24 or 30 or something like that. But I'm sure they could have fixed that. I thought that was something. They missing. easily could have put 75. They could. I guess you can do that as well. You're right. You're right. All right. So who came in next? What do we got? It was Jake Hollister, um, Bo Crockett's buddy. It was, and so you knew straight away they were going to be teaming up. I don't actually have anything for this one, so what about number four? Number four was Billy Dixon. Billy Dixon, and the thing that I got from him is he got a kick to the face as soon as he entered. Now, that's normally kind of unusual. Normally the person comes in, they're running in, they're charging, they're taking out everybody who they can, and he got the exact opposite. He got a kick to the face. All right, what about next one, number five? Number five is Lady Luck. And she went straight for Bo Crockett. There was a lot of negativity towards Bo Crockett in the crowd. Like, get Bo out, throw him over, etc. Et I bet that's pretty good for Bo, though. Oh, I'm sure. He's a heel. And with the, when he used to be with the colonies as well, I'm sure that he's perfectly okay with that. All right, number six. Number six is Isaiah Frazier. And as soon as he got in, he went straight for Sage Phillips. Now, we just talked in the previous match. Percy Davis had the, the four-way encounter, which Isaiah Frazier won. And Sage Phillips was also in that match. So I'm wondering if there's some heat in there that we didn't recognize previously to that. So that was kind of an interesting one for me. All right, number seven, Mason. I want to ask you about this one. Number seven was Graham Bell. So what can you remember about Graham Bell's entrance? So Graham Bell, uh, Graham Bell comes in and he throws these uh, papers that says <laughs> missing bazooka. Uh, missing bazooka. He Have did. you seen this? Have he... you seen this? And he lost it, I think it was about three months ago. And I've seen the story developing on Twitter. And it looked like we were going to get an answer to that question. And we didn't actually get an answer at all. But yeah, he just kept on going up to people. Have you seen it? And he told one person, I don't believe you. And I thought that was kind of an interesting one. I wish I could have grabbed one of those and, flyers. That would have been a great souvenir. And the other thing is that um, his goggles that he comes in with, it kept, it was stuck to his hair. It was, yeah. Somebody had to. I think the ref had to help him at one yeah. point as well. Yeah, he, he had a bit of an issue there, and a bit of a. I think his jacket as well wouldn't come off at one point as well. He had a few little issues as we were going through. All right, what about number eight? Number eight is Aspen Rose. Now I meant to look before we started this. They asked Nova Pro asked for five people who you really wanted to come back. And I'm going to do this off the top of my head. I know you picked Benjamin Banks. I picked Benjamin Banks, Bobby Orlando, Aspen Rose, and Bobby Orlando Jr. as yeah, well, which Bobby. was a really clever pick. You picked Aspen, Aspen Rose. Rose and uh, Jinx. And you picked Jinx. So no. you actually got four of your five people actually in. So you did pretty well on this one. So Aspen Rose, Aspen Rose made a great impression when she came in. Stunners to everybody. Yeah, yeah. We saw stunners at the last one in the, at the Maryland. And we really enjoyed that one there as well. Number nine is Tremor. Tremor. And that was one of the people with the mask. And we didn't know his name to begin with. And that's my other gripe with this. They, they really need to sort out their audio. Yeah, the like, quality is so poor, you just can't hear what they're saying. So it's turning into, Aspen Rose is turning into Laura Van Ness. Tremor's turning into Congo Kong when uh, mm -hmm. Laura Van Ness keeps calming down uh, Congo Kong because he keeps beating up Grado, and mm -hmm. it's turning into that all over again. And there is, that's a great parallel, and I didn't even notice that at all when that match was going on. But yeah, you could see that they were definitely pandering to each other, and she was trying to help him out. Number 11 is Micha Mercenary. I yep. don't know if I pronounced that right, but... And you, I don't know either for this one. And um, yeah, him and Tremor just went for it straight away. Yep. And um, I think he actually did throw Tremor out. Yeah. And then actually he threw Aspen Rose out straight afterwards as well. I think he's part of the Sandwich Squad, though. 
Oh, I think you're right. Is that the guy that we saw as we were walking in? Yeah. Yeah. Because somebody said, um, eat a Bobby sandwich or eat a, <laughs> eat a Bo, eat a Bo sandwich. And they did because Bobby Shields was actually number 11 who was coming in at that point. Yeah, but, uh, Bo Crockett slapped, um, yeah, Misha's stomach and he said, oh, I'm full already. <laughs> All right, what about number 12? So, oh, actually, I'm going to do number 12. So, number 12 was Josh Fuller. Do you want to talk about Josh Fuller's entrance? Josh Fuller runs in, like, Ultimate Warrior, uh-huh. slides through the um, other side of the ring, and then he hides under there, uh, under the ring, and um, the refs are just looking at, like, what? Yeah. He went, through the, uh, he went through the bottom rope, though. He did? Yeah. And it's perfectly legal, and I, I think they should change that rule. I, I don't think you should be touching... If you're on touching the floor, I think you should only get, like, 20 seconds to touch the floor, and then you should be back in the ring. I don't know why you're allowed to sit outside and not get involved, particularly if people don't know. Now, he kept playing it up, though, because he kept poking his head out, so everyone knew that he was still there. Yeah. And you're thinking, how long is he going to stay there? He could stay to the end, and no one have any clue. Now, it didn't actually happen that way. So, number 13 was Kane Justice, who, all I have for this is he started eating an apple. And um, he was the one who attacked Terminator. Oh, oh, of course. I knew I was That's why name, those two were fighting in the middle okay. of the Okay, all right. And then 14, Bro Keller came in, and actually he did get Josh Fuller out and he yeah. put him back into the ring. All right, what about 15? Number 15 is Slade Porter. It is, and I got Slade Porter as the Phantom of the Opera. I don't think you know, recognize that reference, but it's something nope. basically has a half mask on his face, and he looks just like the character. Okay, so what about number 16? Number 16 is Jackson Stone. Jackson Stone. And I think he made his debut a couple of months ago for this one. And as soon as he came in, he just gave uppercuts to everyone. Everyone sort of had their little thing. Like, uh, Aspen yeah. Rose was doing stunners, and uh, his little thing was up there. They looked powerful as well. Yeah. They looked yeah. like he was giving some applause. All right, 17 was Alley Cat, and she gave two eliminations straight away. She got Slade out, who'd only just come in, Slade Porter at 15. And finally, Bo Crockett, which was kind of to a chair as well, because I think everyone was about done with Bo Crockett at this point. All right, what about 18? Was Mac Buckler. And I think we've seen him before, but I couldn't really remember anything specific. Yeah, Josh Fuller, his dad. Oh, okay. I don't think it's his dad. I think it's his uh, partner. Whatever. I know Josh Fuller's kind of young, but I don't think it's his, uh, it's his dad. Now, some of these I don't have anything for, not because they didn't necessarily do anything, but there's a lot going on. Some of these... Some of these points is like 10 people in the ring at once and you're just watching different things uh 19 19 is harlow o'hara who'd already fought earlier and got a win and her thing was she was straight for alley cat yeah. now i would have thought the women would have stuck together now i know we've said she's a heel but even so i still thought she would have gone for somebody different and I'm, there's no beef between those two at all as far as i could tell and having talked about beef number 20 is big beef which is uh, jake garvin and he knows for alley cat as well i'm like wow what, what has alley cat done to deserve all this Okay, what about 21 then? 21 was Christy James. Finally, some support for Ali Cat, seeing as she's getting beaten by Harlow O'Hara and Jake Garvin. And they actually hid in the corner for a little while, which yeah. is actually not a bad little tactic. It looked like that kind of scaredy cat image, which they played up on a previous thing. All right, 22. The masked villain. I don't have anything for him. I don't think there was a lot going on at this point. 23. Eric Royal. And he came in and eliminated Jackson Stone pretty quickly, and also Bobby Shields as well. Now, for me, that was a surprise. Because I actually thought what was going to happen is the one percenters are going to make it to the end. They're going to help each other. There's going to be three of them. And then they're definitely going to win. What about number 24? Number 24 is John Kerman, the Terminator, who got attacked attacked by King Justice. And he went, um, King Justice was out our side. Mm -hmm. And then he, as soon as he saw John, he, they came in in the middle of the ring and started fighting each other. And 25 was Angela Swain, and then 26 was Mickey Banker, who was True True. Yeah. Now, I didn't realize this. He's only He might not even be 20 years old yet. He was born in 1998. Oh. So if he hasn't had his birthday this year, he's 19. Wow, I did not realize he was that young. There's some really young talent in Nova Pro as well, like Jordan Grace only just turned 22 as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, 27, Logan Easton LaRoe came in. So now we're starting to get some of those one percenters. Although Bobby Shields is already gone. So Logan's actually by himself at this point. Um, he gave a stunner to the Terminator, but I don't think that eliminated him at this point. All right, what about 28? Bobby Orlando. Bobby Orlando came in. And I didn't even know he was going to be there once because he didn't post anything on Twitter. And I was like, oh, that's kind of disappointing. I was hoping to see him. And he just kept it quiet. But then he actually appeared for a second time. And he actually threw his goat to True True. And then True True just threw the goat straight over the top rope. And Brian, with probably the line of the night, is like, comes on and the goat has been eliminated, which I, I thought was brilliant. I thought that was great. The crowd really liked that. The crowd on the far side were chanting something to Brian, and I couldn't hear what it was, unfortunately. But you could tell that he, he acknowledged it. It was something they were saying that he did a good job, basically. 
All right, as we're getting towards the end then, 29? Gary Miller. So Logan's got some support now. And number 30, the clown figure walked out, which is Jean-Jean Le Bon. And I knew that that was part of that 1% or part of the gated community. So now they've suddenly got three people together and that storyline is starting to play out. How lucky is it that they can come out? Logan at 27, Gunnar Miller at 29, and Jean-Jean Le Bon at 30. Now, the thing that was weird about this, and we don't know the backstory for this, Bobby Shields came back out again. And he says, it's not me. It's not me. So I don't know if that's like one of his alter egos, one of his characters he plays. So yeah, I don't know what happened with that. So I guess the clown probably wasn't on their side. And we never found out who it was. No. We have no idea who it was. Um, I have Logan Easton and Leroy being knocked out at this point. And then actually Gunnar got the clown, um, Jean-Jean Le Bon, and actually threw him out, whoever that was. So at this point, we're actually starting to get down to fairly few numbers. We're down to seven. Terminator got knocked out, and it set up a three-on-three. -three. And this was where it started to balance out nicely. We got Sage Phillips who came in number two, had a tough match with Jonathan Gresham, and he's still in there. Sage, um, Eric Royal, and Ali. And on the other side, we got Gunner, Angelus Lane, and Justice Kane. And it, it was kind of a little pause at this point as they separated on the ring. And then Gunner sneezed. And somebody from the audience shouts out, are you allergic to cats? And he actually nodded. And he actually acknowledged that thing. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was yeah. a really strange thing to do. But he actually set him up as a really human character, because we always see him as that tough guy. And we said when we saw him smile off outside the ring, it looked kind of weird because he plays such a tough guy. I thought it was really nice that he actually humanized him a little bit. Yeah. It made him look more normal. Anyway, once that had gone, they went straight onto it. Um, Gunnar threw Sage over, so he, he made it down to the last five. He did really well. Um, Eric eliminated Kane, and that took it down to four. So we've got left now, then. We have um, Eric and Ali. And on the other side, we've got Gunnar and Angelus. Now, this is where I started to get confused, because I couldn't try and figure out how this goes. You don't want to pair up together. If, if, if Ali Cat and Eric work together and get the other two out, Ali's losing to Eric Royal. There's no chance. Similarly, if Angelus and Gunnar work together and they eliminate the other two, Angelus has not beaten Gunnar Miller. No. So I was really confused how they were actually going to do this. Can you remember what happened from the last four? Uh, no, not really. All right. So what actually happened was they did play that out, and Ali took out Angelus Lane, and then at that point you think, well, it's obviously going to come from those two against one. Angelus Lane got back inside the ring, yeah. even though she was already already knocked out, and then she took Ali Cat and threw her out. Now, I think that's an unfair rule. I think if you're taken out by somebody who's been eliminated, that shouldn't count. Anyway, it did, and they continued fighting outside the ring, and I think that's probably going to be a match for the next one. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. So we're down to two. We're down to Gunner, and we're down to Eric, who fought fairly recently as well, and Gunner actually had the advantage... And it was close. It looked like Eric was going to win. Um, he managed to get Gunnar out of the ring twice. His feet were dangling. And then Gunnar, for a big guy, very athletic, managed to get himself back in the ring. And then he did it on our side of the ring as well. And he was close. He got some strength. Got it back in again. And anyway, in the final, the final way he did get knocked out was Gunnar's running towards Eric. He dropped the top rope. And I was not. I'm not even convinced by that. I'm like, sure, you can slam on the brakes a little bit. Anyway, he went straight over the top. And um, Eric won. So, what was the prize besides the fact that he won the Old Dominion Rumble, Mason? He gets to choose his first round for the um, Commonwealth Cup. He does. And who did he pick? Logan. Logan Easton Leroux. And that's why I said the storyline from early is kind of important. They fought in the final of the last Commonwealth Cup. And uh, Logan actually got the better of him on that one. And then they fought in what was considered one of the matches of the year last year. In the first event that we went to, and we didn't actually get to see that match because we had to leave early. Well, I was tired and we left. Yeah. And we watched it on Powerbomb TV later. And on that one, um, Eric got the advantage. So it's been kind of even. I think that's interesting he picks Logan. But Logan was scared of him in that Ugly Dufflings match. When Eric tagged in, he went straight out and said, I want nothing to do with him. So it could be our defending Commonwealth Cup champion could be out in round one with him yeah. having picked that. Or is the other 1% going to interfere? Um, uh, interference? <laughs> so who you got for that first round match? This is the only matchup we actually know right now. Because all the other ones, we just know contestants. We don't know how they're going to pair up. So I'm going to ask you right now, who's going to win? Is it going to be Logan Easton Leroux? Or is it going to be Eric Royal? Um, it's going to be Eric Royal. And I think I have an idea who Jean-Jean Le Bon is. Oh, okay. It might be one of the ugly ducklings. Uh, it could have been. It could have been anybody. I have no idea who it was. Because he was against the one percenters. Correct. Good man. I have absolutely no idea who it was. So you're going for Eric Royal, you say, for that yeah. one? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna, I am gonna. was going to go for Eric Royal as well, actually. Uh, I think they're going to be some sort of... You never know with Logan. All right. It'll be an interesting one to see how that goes. I was going to ask you, how long do you think the match went on? The um, old Dominion Rumble? Yeah, just the Dominion Rumble. 
So we talked about the other one, like the longest match was like 12 minutes or something. How long do you think the, the Rumble went on for? 50 minutes. That's pretty good. 51 minutes and 44 seconds. Oh. I like the fact that it was that 75 seconds. I thought that kept it more exciting, actually. It kept constantly sending people in, and you just didn't have a time. That's why for a lot of these people, we didn't have anything. Within 75 seconds, I just had to make a note who was coming in, and then it was something quick. But I wanted to watch it. I was engrossed in it. I thought it was great. All right, after that match, um, normally we've left. As soon as that last match is done, we're out of there. We want to get home. It's late, and it was late for this one. Uh, we stayed behind. We got to see Benjamin Banks. We got to see uh, Victor Griff. We got our picture with them. Oh, you got your picture with them anyway. I, I was the photographer for this one. Uh, we did see Bobby Shields, so we managed to get your picture autographed. And um, that was it. It was a great night. Uh, for me, it was the best Nova Pro event that we've been to so far. Um, anything you want to add in at the end? Yeah, you want more? Um, yeah, we saw we saw Bobby Shields and Logan Laroe in the parking lot, and then uh, we saw the hooligans, and then... <laughs> we saw a lot of people by staying until the end, and it kind of makes you realize that, yeah, they're just like us, really, but they're just they're playing that role. I really felt like I was a wrestler when I walked into bath to use the bathroom, <laughs> and also the back areas there, and I was walking right behind Gooder Miller, and yeah. I... You and do see a lot of those into, characters. Uh, I almost bumped into Logan. Yeah, Bobby was actually parked right next to us, I think. Yeah. Well, there was one car that pulled out, but he was essentially next to us because we got there so early. The only thing I want to tag in on the end, I know that, I can't remember the name of the group. Um, I know they they have that snack society, the Nova Pro, they time different snacks. We actually stopped at 7-Eleven to get some food. Uh, we got a couple of hot dogs, pretty standard there. The chips, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to give a five-star rating to those chips. We actually yeah. got some 7-Eleven uh, home brand chips or whatever. Uh, can you remember which yours were? I got the prime rib. You got the prime rib, which I was going to get, and I tasted them. I thought they were really good. Yeah. And I actually picked out, I think it was spicy guacamole, yeah. and they were really good. A dollar a bag, I'm giving those a five-star rating. So that's our little contribution to the Snack Society for this one. And the next event, you don't have to wait long for the next episode, actually. Um, A4 is going to come out, I believe it's in three weeks' time. Ooh. I think it said it was going to be May the 10th. I did actually see the name for it, and I forgot to write it down. Uh, we're on Twitter at MGB Wrestling Pod. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Bagshaw. Um, please try and subscribe, give us a five star rating, and review us on iTunes at the Visionaries Wrestling Network. Mention us by name, the MGB Wrestling Podcast, and give mention to Mason as well, too. All these things help us get recognized even more, so please take a couple of minutes to do this if you haven't already done so. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye. Music was Zigzag by Kevin McLeod at Incompitech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0, HTTP colon slash slash creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by slash 3.0 slash. M is for Mason. G is for Graham. B for Betcha. This is the MGB Wrestling Podcast, the podcast with PG rated material accessible to wrestling fans of all ages. My name is Graham Bagshaw, and my co-host and creator of this podcast is proof that wrestling fans live with their parents, my 10-year-old son, Mason. So, this is episode A3. Uh, this is our Nova Pro review of the Old Dominion Rumble, which was at the Jewish Community Center on Friday, April the 20th. Okay, do you want to get us started, Mason? You want to tell us about what we noticed when we arrived, first of all? When we noticed when we arrived... The um the front of the building was um under construction, so we had to go through the back, and the gym just looked twice as big too. Well, it looked actually worse than that. They took the letters off from the sign. They had um, barriers across the door, and it looked, for all intents and purposes, it was closed. We were there pretty early, and there was only a few people hanging around the door where the wrestlers normally go, and it just turned out we were just early, I guess. So. But yeah, they're obviously doing some renovations there. Once we parked the car and walked back, it made it clear what was going on. But yeah, uh, it was certainly a little different. 
Now, we actually got to join the front line today because it was, um, hey, anybody who's paid in this front row, you get to move to this side and you get to go in first, which was us for the first time. Yeah. So we were one of the first few people in, so we got to pick wherever we wanted. So we picked um, normally where the camera's behind us, dead center. And actually with the renovations, they've moved the camera. So we were actually, from the camera's perspective, we were on the right-hand side of the ring, but perfectly good seat. Yeah. All right, what did we do after that then? So we got our seats. We went to the one percenters and we got James Alexander. No, Alexander James. I always get his name mixed Shields, up as well. Faye Jackson and Veda Scott. We did, and we saw that they posted just after the last one that they had some uh, some pictures, and it was ones that we hadn't seen. Um, some of them were quite old ones, so we asked them, "Hey, do you still have any ones of these?" And they said, "Yeah, we'll we'll make sure you've got some." And they posted their merchandise ahead of time, so we picked up the ones that we hadn't got. Um, Alexander James wasn't there, unfortunately, on this one, uh, but we did manage to see all the other people, and we'll probably talk about those a little bit later as well. So we picked up those pictures unautographed at this point. Okay, what else? We also saw Jake Parnell. We did. Yep, the war horse. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get to see him last time. We wanted to see him last time. Uh, he was busy. I uh, didn't get a chance to say hi to him. We actually saw him as he walked in as well. We had, we saw quite a few wrestlers yeah. actually walking in because they came through the same entrance that we came through. Yeah. But we well, we say we didn't say anything at that point because they got suitcases and everything and getting. And ready. we saw his pants. <laughs> yeah, he has those stripy pants. He's always trying to sell those things on Twitter as well. I can't remember what they're called. They're something from the eighties uh, or nineties. I know, mommy was. I actually did buy a pair that's got the Carolina Panthers on because I was going to wear them for Wacky Tacky Day at school. But, yeah, I won't be wearing them any normal time, that's for sure. Yeah, so we saw Jake. Uh, we got a picture. We got an autograph. Uh, we got a photo, all that stuff that we like to do when we're there. And I think that's pretty much it. We saw other people there. We saw people like Jordan Grace was there, Jonathan Gresham. Uh, we saw the Ugly Ducklings, of course. But I think pretty much we went to our seat because we know that there was going to be some sort of pre-match entertainment or that first one, and that's exactly what happened. What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Benjamin Banks, and you're listening to the MGB Wrestling Podcast. So, in match one, it was Benjamin Banks and Diamond Victor Griff in a tag team match versus Bobby Orlando and Harry Zen, featuring Bobby Jr., which is his go. This was the one we were most excited about, because Benjamin Banks, we just interviewed for, we just released episode nine a couple of days ago. Episode eight was when we interviewed Benjamin Banks, so we were excited about this match. You want to talk about this one, Mason? I saw you in the middle of Matt switch on um, turned on Benjamin and started rooting for Bobby, <laughs> but I stayed with Benjamin the whole time. And yeah, when they walked out, we put the pinkies up, and they said we were doing it wrong. Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, Diamond Victor Griff was like, "You're doing the pinkies, but you're doing it wrong." And well, I would guess I wasn't paying attention to the picture enough to, to find that out. But yeah, they're right. What I should have said is the last time, actually, Benjamin Banks and Diamond Victor Griff, they actually beat Cisco and Jason Radatz at Sink or Swim. And that was their debut match. So they're 1-0 and o going into this one. And um, Harry Zen, who's partnering with Bobby Orlando, actually beat Bobby Orlando and CPA at Sink or Swim. So Harry Zen's going in 1-0 and, and Bobby Orlando's going in 1-0. 